Coming up on DTNS, TCL delays its foldable partly because of shortages. Geo delays its cheap smartphone entirely because of chip shortages. And the first round of the epic Apple battle is over. Who's ahead as we head in to the appeals? DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 10th, 2021. Getting ready to make you smarter in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger J. We were just talking about the 80s. Uh, mm. Lots of lots of reminiscing uh, about uh, mostly clothing and other things. Uh, get that wider conversation. Get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join our talk patrons, such as Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and High Tech Oki. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google began rolling out its Material U design system to its apps on Android, including Gmail, Calendar, and Docs. This design lets Pixel devices with Android 12 or newer match the colors inside apps with their wallpapers. Apple fans love to hear from Ming-Chi Kuo, the Apple analyst. And Kuo says Apple has worked out its Apple Watch Series 7 production issues and will start mass producing new models later this month with a launch as early as the end of the month. So that, that makes it likely we'd hear about it September 14th. Kuo says the new Apple Watch had to go through more production processes than previous models because of a change in the design that includes a more durable display panel, which uses a contact design instead of the old cable design, and also requires requires a low injection pressure over molding or lipo <laughs> get it uh, process for the first time. Vivo announced its photography focused X70 smartphone lineup. The top end X70 Pro Plus is the first phone to offer optical image stabilization on all four rear cameras, including when shooting video, as well as a V1 AI imaging chip for better noise reduction in low light. Specs are otherwise 2021 Android flagship standard with a Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 Plus system on a chip. There's also the X70 Pro and X70 phones with MediaTek Dimensity 1200 chipsets, optically stables, st stabilized rear main cameras, but those lack the V1 chip. The X70 Pro Plus starts at 5,499 yuan. That's about 854 US dollars. The X70 Pro starts from... 4,299 won, and the X70 starts from 3,699 won, with devices initially rolling out in China, India, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, and the United Arab Emirates. DoorDash, Uber, and Grubhub filed a lawsuit together against the city of New York in federal court, disputing a law passed last month capping the amount of commission that food delivery apps can charge restaurants. New York wanted to limit what the restaurants get charged by the delivery companies. The suit asks for an injunction against the law going into effect, monetary damages, and requests a jury trial. The firms allege the law constitutes government overreach, forcing them to rewrite contracts with restaurants and raising fees for customers. Twitter began testing a new automated account label that's meant to let accounts self-identify as bot accounts. The label is not meant to label bot accounts posing as real people, however. The label is in testing with 500 developer accounts now. Ah, so which bot can I trust? Now I'll be able to know. All right, let's talk about this. Well, I'm calling the first round because this, this is far from over, but U.S. District Jury Court Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers has issued her decision in the epic v apple case 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 the court found in favor of apple on all counts except with respect to a violation of california's unfair competition law that's what this all probably will hinge on but let's start with the points apple won the court found epic breached its contract with apple by implementing an alternative payment system and is ordered to pay apple 30 percent of everything it collected through that alternative system which is estimated to be around three and a half million dollars. So she said, Epic, you can't just go off on your own and start a payment system when you knew it breached the contract. The court did not find Apple violated any trust law uh, based on the marketplace at issue. The judge actually rejected both companies' definitions of the marketplace and determined her own. She noted that 70% of Apple's App Store revenue is generated by gaming apps and gaming app consumers are primarily generating revenue by making in-app purchases. So she wrote, the relevant market here is digital mobile gaming transactions, not gaming generally, and not Apple's own internal operating systems related to the App Store. 
She ruled that Apple is not a monopolist in that market, writing, while the court finds that Apple enjoys considerable market share of over 55% and extraordinarily high profit margins, these factors alone do not show antitrust conduct. Success is not illegal. <laughs> but Apple lost one big point. The court found that Apple violated California's unfair competition law by preventing developers from offering alternative payment options and communicating with their customers about it. Regarding Apple's argument that, hey, these policies promote security, she wrote, Apple argues that its policies protect consumers against fraudulent attacks. The data is far from clear. What is certain is Apple's decision prohibits information from flowing directly to the consumer so that customers can make these choices for themselves. So she didn't buy the security argument. She determined that Apple would not suffer from allowing communication about alternative payment options, writing, loosening the restrictions will increase competition as it will force Apple to compete on the benefits of its centralized model, or it will have to change its monetization model in a way that is actually tied to the value of its intellectual property. She's saying, basically, like, Apple, you have to let them say there's an alternative, and then you compete and show that your alternative is better. So to remedy the anti-competitive behavior, Judge Gonzalez-Rogers issued a permanent injunction saying that Apple may not stop developers from, and here I'll quote, including in their apps and their metadata, buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms. In addition to in-app purchasing and communicating with customers through points of contact obtained voluntarily from customers through account registration within the app. I mean, you didn't quite catch all that. It's a little legalistically written. It means Apple can't kick an app out of its app store for linking to alternative ways to make in-app purchases. It doesn't seem to require Apple to let developers offer those methods in app, though there are some arguments about what is meant by a button. Neil Patel from The Verge thinks that button gives you the in to maybe offer them inside your app. Either way, Apple can't stop them from saying there's an alternative out there and linking to it on the web or wherever. And Apple can't stop developers from telling customers how to subscribe outside the app. Now, the order does not take effect until December 9th. The injunction goes into effect 90 days from today. So December 9th is when it would go into effect. However, by that time, Apple's likely to have appealed and they may convince a higher court to pause that injunction. So don't expect to see widespread changes in the Apple App Store, certainly before December and probably not even then. You know, when this uh, Apple Epic case uh, you know, started, what did we talk about? Back in March, I think it was. Mm. I remember thinking, I find there almost no way for Apple to lose. And that's not because I necessarily agreed with Apple, but it's just Apple. You know, it's, it's you know, they can they can lawyer up and and I I figured I figured this would be something that they could escape on some level. And it's funny because when you read the the and this is of course you know from Apple's PR team and and uh, and and spokespeople saying you know we're we're you know, super happy with how the judge has ruled against Epic in this case. It's like, really what Epic was arguing for is what Apple has now been forced to reverse. I don't feel like Apple has walked away with any sort of victory today. Like you said, Tom, could be an appeal and the appeal you know, could could reverse all of this, but it, it seems like Epic should feel pretty good about itself today. I mean, Epic wanted a definitive win, right? They wanted to crush Apple. So in that respect, Apple yeah. did well because it's just the in-app payment communication part of this that Epic won. But that was also the main thing that Epic wanted to be able to offer. And it sounds like, you know, if this decision were to stand, which it won't, there'll be an appeal. It'll be years before we know. That's my guess before we really yeah. know. But if it were to stand, I, I think Epic would, would call this a win. Shannon, what do you think? I like this judge. <laughs> um, I really appreciate that she's looking at this entire case from so many different components, especially like the marketplace issue. You know, she came up with her own definition, and I think that's extremely important because it gives both Apple and Epic um, playing ground here, and it gives them both a chance at winning this case. But given that she brought in California's unfair competition law, uh, that's extremely important when it comes to this, uh, especially because, you know, Epic uh, definitely wants their fair share of their profits. So I'm really 
I'm really interested to keep on following this, even though I'm not a huge Apple gaming person myself, just to see how it turns out, because I feel like this could set a major precedent going forward, not just for Apple, but for other platforms as well. Yeah, no, and Epic has a lawsuit against Google. Uh, this will definitely affect that lawsuit. There's no doubt about that. Uh, also, Epic had asked if they could be reinstated by Apple in Korea. Remember, Korea passed a, a law saying that you could link out. Uh, they, they basically passed a law that is similar to this decision. And, and Apple said, no, we're not going to reinstate you until this is all legally settled. I don't know that this is going to change that, uh, especially because... Epic does have oh Apple three and a half million dollars for violating the contract. So Apple can say like, look, you legally have been proven to have violated a contract. Why would we reinstate you uh, for any reason? Uh, so until this is all, uh, you know, at the final appeals court, wherever that ends up being, uh, I I don't think you're going to see Fortnite back in the in the App Store uh, until they they settle all of this. And uh, that, like I said, like I keep saying, that that's going to be a while. Uh, <laughs> Frankly, I think this is a this is the decision I would make. So I think it's a great decision because I, I look at it and I say, yeah, Apple's probably not antitrust, but stopping a developer from even saying there's an alternative, uh, that that feels like it's a, a bridge too far. And that's exactly what the the judge uh, decided. You you may disagree with me out there. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Let us know what you think. All right, let's go to some encryption, Shannon. Yes, let's. Well, in the coming weeks, WhatsApp is rolling out its options for all users to encrypt their chat backups in the cloud. Now, as you know, WhatsApp chats are already end-to-end -end encrypted, but if you wanted to store them for a backup, then you would have to encrypt them yourself somehow. And that's pretty loose, loose ended there. Now it's built in. So when this rolls out to you, if you choose end to end encrypted backup, you will have two different options. Both of those options start by generating a 64 digit encryption key to encrypt the backup. One of the options is to store that key yourself offline or you could store it in a password manager of your choosing. And then if you lose it, that would be completely on you. Option number two is to create a password for a backup key vault, and that stores your key in the cloud. That password would also be non-recoverable, so only, again, you would know it. In either case, if you cannot access your key, your backup is completely unrecoverable. WhatsApp will not be able to do anything about it because they don't know your key. WhatsApp says that it will roll out the option in every single one of its markets. So what what's the effect of this? Uh, I, I know a lot of people do like to, to save their chats, uh, and I guess you could have saved them locally and encrypted yourself, but but this just makes it easier to do it and, and be protected? Yeah, it makes it more convenient. And, and of course, as you mentioned, like not everybody is going to want to do this. This is just, for example, if you are worried that you're going to lose your phone, lose the application that or device that you're using WhatsApp on, this will allow you to have that backup so that you can recover all of that chat history, any kind of media files, if you choose to back up those as well, onto your new device. So if something happened, if your device got stolen, you would always have that backup. I feel like that would be super useful if like you have family in another state and a bunch of photos saved in WhatsApp, and you wanna make sure that you can recover those photos. So in that way, it's extremely useful. But again, it's completely optional, so not everybody is going to want to use this. So. If you were going to use this, uh, if I was using WhatsApp, I would definitely want to use that 64-bit key and not have to deal with remembering my own password, which could impose its own vulnerabilities if somebody figured out what my password was, if I wasn't generating a random password using a password manager. So I would recommend if you were going to do this, which is completely optional, again, it's an opt-in encryption option, uh, then use that 64-bit encryption key. Now, I did look at the white paper because I'm a ner total nerd when it comes to encryption, and they're using, um, it's built based on a component which is called the hardware security module. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty neat because if there is any kind of brute forcing involved, if somebody is really attempting to get that 64-bit key, it will render the key permanently inaccessible after a limited number of unsuccessful attempts to access it. So in that way, um, I'm glad that they included that because I was really worried about brute forcing. I was worried that if somebody did figure out your password, would they be able to get in? But if they're just trying like all sorts of recently leaked passwords and trying to figure out how to get in, then they may not be able to. So I'm glad that they included that. Um, all in all, I, 
I, I, you know, I keep on talking about this, but it seems like a very good encryption option. I do wish that they required it if you wanted to do cloud backups, but this is an optional add on basically. It's a nice feature to have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think I, I would take your advice and, and, and probably say for most people store that key yourself so that, that it's under your control. Uh, and if you're worried about losing it, uh, put it in your password manager because you're you're yeah. you're going to work very hard to keep your password manager secure and not lose your password manager. And that way you don't have to worry about one extra thing, I guess. I appreciate that WhatsApp is adding this convenience for consumers because they are they're helping normalize the idea of using end-to-end -end encryption and they're normalizing the idea of encrypting your cloud backups and hopefully this also introduces the concept of you can't necessarily trust every cloud provider that you're using and you have to make sure that you're encrypting your files that you're putting up there beforehand because they may not be encrypting them for you. So Google and Apple, whoever your cloud provider may be, they may still be able to access your files. So having that knowledge and understanding that encrypting is important is, is really important to get consumers understanding. Cool. Thanks, Shannon. No problem. Well, we know that many of you are fans of foldables out there and more than a few of you because <laughs> you let us know. So we have some sad news, at least sad for now. TCL will not bring its foldable phone to the market this year as previously planned. Now TCL has paraded prototypes in front of reporters like the one that wrapped around your wrist, the one that folded into thirds. One of our favorites here at DTNS, the foldable and rollable in the same device. TCL was really going in on foldables. Nobody expected those to make it to market this year, but TCL's Chicago project, which is the Galaxy Z flip-like device, was supposed to launch this week. CNET even got a finished prototype to look at. It seemed very real, very happening. But Friday, TCL Chief Marketing Officer Stefan Schreit said that a foldable is now 12 to 18 months away and it won't be in the Chicago project. TCL cites the lack of brand recognition as one factor. It makes phones under the Alcatel and BlackBerry names, but not too many under the TCL brand name just yet. It also cited a lack of carrier support, which can be a death to even the strongest brand. And it finally cited expensive components due to supply shortages, mm -hmm. meaning that TCL couldn't hit the price point that it wanted. TCL is certainly not alone there. Uh, Shreet said that the lowest price that they could reach was $800, which was too close to the Z Flip 3, which starts at $1,000. You know, got to get it under if they thought they were going to sell enough uh, units. Compared to the Flip, the TCL foldable was a little thicker, a little wider, also a little heavier. Its front screen was smaller by almost an inch as well. It also wasn't waterproof, used a lesser processor. These are things that some people care about a lot. All of that would be fine if it was significantly cheaper, but TCL just couldn't make that happen. So on the back burner for now. So it's back to the drawing board with the aim to make a thinner, sturdier device to be available in either 2022 or even 2023 when component prices are hoped to be back to normal and TCL will have had time to increase brand awareness. Shannon, I know you like fold foldables, right? I do. I'm just grabbing my... Z Fold 3 that I've been playing with for the past week. And and I've also reviewed a lot of the TCL phones. So when I saw this news, I was kind of bummed out because I was so excited to see the concepts that they were introducing on their foldable phones. And I want to see more competition in this market. I don't want to just, just have Samsung as the option right now, which it really seems like that's the only, uh, only relative option. And TCL's phones, even though most of them are budget phones that I have checked out in, in person so far, they're really good and they are very competitive. Like their phone, the battery life is great on them. The cameras are excellent. So I was very interested to see them come out with these foldable phones, but I think they made the smart decision and I'm not going to be angry at them for delaying these phones. They have a lot playing against them, especially in the US market. Uh, the brand awareness is a huge one. I often tell people like I'm reviewing a TCL phone and they don't necessarily recognize that as a phone maker they're like oh the tv brand yes mm -hmm. the tv brand mm -hmm. so they definitely have a lot working against them and i'm i'm hoping that they do continue trying to work on these prototypes because i would love to see them come to market next year even if even if the price is fairly close to samsung's i still think that they have a 
they have a potential there because they are really good with displays. And I think that's especially important when it comes to foldables. So we shall see, but I'm, I definitely have uh, a lot of optimism here. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing CNET said uh, when they, they got their hands on the prototype of this was the crease wasn't as prominent as it is mm -hmm. in the flip. Uh, which, yeah. you know, is, is one of the big things that they're, they're trying to reduce. So yeah, TCL being very transparent here and saying, look, uh, we, we, we knew this wasn't going to go spec for spec with the flip and at only $200 less, people are just going to buy the flip. So we, we needed to be 400. They didn't put a price on it, but they were basically saying we needed to be $400, $500 cheaper, you know, like eye poppingly cheaper, uh, to, to make that work. So yeah, it seems like the right decision. You know what else is the right decision? Supporting us on Patreon uh, and sticking with us. In fact, we are happy to offer loyalty rewards for folks who don't leave. Uh, you can get a unique sticker, a mug, a t-shirt, or a hoodie every three months. Another one, as long as you stay a patron at a certain level. Each one has unique art from Len Peralta featuring the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo. Uh, some have images of Roger, some Sarah, some me. Get the details and find out which tiers have them at patreon.com slash DTNS. <laughs> DJ mixes are enjoyed by billions of people, but they are incredibly complicated for streaming services to host because of the mix of copyrights involved. Lots of artists. Mix not only contain whole songs, each of which has an artist that must properly be paid, but often remixes also include lots of samples, complicating things even more. Apple Music announced it is using technology from Shazam, which can automatically identify music to identify and complicate compensate all creators involved in a DJ's mix. Apple has hosted thousands of mixes for a while, including sets from Tomorrowland's digital festivals in 2020 and 2021, and now we know how they account for it. Apple has also announced that Studio K7's DJ Kicks archive of mixes will begin to roll out on the service, including mixes dating back up to 15 years. That's a long time. Apple's music DJ mixes will not include user-generated content. So if you want to upload your personal mix or lip sync, you will will need to stick to SoundCloud or TikTok for now. Yeah, my guess is uh, Shazam, as good as it is, and it's very good, isn't perfect. Uh, and so, you know, if you're limiting who can upload these things, uh, they say you, you have to be able to account for at least 70% uh, of the stuff uh, in your mix. Uh, that makes it easier for them to defend against people challenging whether they got it right or not. Whereas if you open it up to user generated, as Facebook and YouTube and everybody else knows, uh, it's really hard to moderate that stuff. Uh, even if you've got a Shazam on your side. So I'm not really surprised they haven't done user-generated content. Also, just not really Apple's thing to be you know, opened up like that. <laughs> See previous App Store <laughs> lawsuits uh, <laughs> as an example. So yeah, I, I, I think this is cool though, because even if it isn't wide open, it's, it's certainly going to make uh, DJ mixes more accessible on Apple Music, and we, that's going to give Apple Music a leg up on Spotify. Yeah, and I uh, Apple bought Shazam in I think it was about three years ago in 2018, and I remember at the time saying Shazam is so great for identifying songs. You know, if I'm sitting in a restaurant, I'm like, oh, I love the song. Who sings it? Works really well. But I always wondered, okay, well, what what's the point? You know, besides just owning that technology, what what where can Apple do something else with the technology? And took a while, but this is a really great example of that. Yeah, and and uh, I, I know there's probably a lot of people in our audience who who aren't as into the mixes and 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 whatnot as some people, but uh, you know it it's still incredibly popular if you're if you're unfamiliar with it, and so it's going to bring in a huge audience. Yeah. All right, it's now time to talk unicorns, Sarah. <sighs> I'm so excited. So Chinese EV maker Xpeng, if you haven't heard of it, uh, Xpeng is, a, you know, makes EVs, uh, says that it intends to make a quadruped robot unicorn. Yes, you heard me right. It's a robot, looks like a unicorn, and it's meant for children to ride like a horsey, but it's a unicorn <laughs> and it's also a robot. SCMP reports it could navigate multiple terrain types. It could also recognize objects. You know, it's a smart robot after all and it could also provide emotional interaction to those kids riding it or 
I don't know, hanging out with it next to it. XPeng has provided no details on pricing or availability. So grains of salt here. This could be as mythical as a real unicorn. Sometimes these things do not come to real fruition. However, XPeng CEO He Xiaopeng does say that the unicorn is part of a broader move into the robotic space by using XPeng's existing technology. And that technology does exist. So listen. We know this is a company's way of announcing a pivot from one market to another. You know, it's, they're using a robot unicorn for that. But it's a robot unicorn. <laughs> What's not to like? Well played, x -Pen. Well played. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I looked at the story and I'm like, all right, the story here is that, you know, somebody who has uh, a certain kind of technology and maybe they're not getting uptake in, in as many sectors of autonomous vehicles as they like, so they're looking for other ways to monetize it. Uh, this is a great way to get attention. But sure, you can know all that, but my heart says <laughs> unicorn. Uh, Sarah, unicorns are real. And also, I hope this thing has a very high weight limit so that I can ride it to Starbucks because that would be amazing. I know. I was like, what do you mean kids? Like, I mean, yeah, like what, what's going on here? What are you defining I'm as a kid. a kid? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I need emotional support big time. <laughs> this is a perfect for me. And I think that, you know, my first reaction was like, well, is this safe? And then I was thinking, well, are skateboards safe? Right. Uh, there's so, so many things that kids play with that are, I mean, potentially unsafe, not necessarily for everybody, but uh, lawn something darts, like this. Okay, those are illegal, but maybe- Lawn darts are pretty <laughs> not safe, but yeah. but but it's-, it's <laughs> This like, unicorn's no lawn dart. It's way I safer. just feel like there's going to be a time in the not too distant future where kids go, what, you you didn't have a robot when you, you were growing up? You didn't have robotic unicorns when you were a kid? <laughs> Yeah, and oh we all gosh. say no, we didn't. No, yeah. we didn't. Yeah, my niece, my niece is so into unicorns too. Like she would, she would go crazy. In fact, uh, her father works for The Verge. Really hope he can get a review unit for her somehow. That would be, that would be amazing. I, mean, I feel like I'm pretty into unicorns, and I, you know, I always have been. You don't grow out of it necessarily. Yeah, I want oh, one, nope. X Peng. If Sean gets one, I'll make sure you can come visit. Thank you. I'll Thank you. I'll live with it for yes. a few months. Yeah. Just ride it around the neighborhood, scare my neighbors. <laughs> uh, real quickly, uh, we we mentioned the uh, chip shortage impact on, on um, uh, TCL earlier. Uh, chip shortage striking another victim. India's Geo Platforms announced it's delaying its Geo Phone Next. Uh, remember, the Geo Phone Next is that Android phone that Geo uh, created with Google to be less than a hundred dollars equivalent. Uh, in rupees, but still have a lot of features on it, uh, like like language translation and uh, text to speech and a really good camera. Uh, there are 300 million Indian users on 2G. This was is meant to try to get them onto the 4G network. Uh, it was supposed to come out September 10th, uh, but they need a couple more months uh, to work out supply issues. Uh, and so this one isn't even for multiple reasons. It's directly like we just can't get the chips uh, to make it right now. So now they're thinking around the time of the Diwali Festival, early November, we might see that phone. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Social Savant, who says, I've been inspired to share my thoughts with the show and audience regarding the NFT loot bags that were mentioned in episode 4104 which uh, was last Friday's episode. As a fan of tabletop gaming, says Social Savant, I found myself thinking of Warhammer 40K as I listened to the discussion. Are these loot bags not like the miniatures which are sold in game and hobby stores? Minis are purchased by artists and gamers and yes, even speculators among others. These buyers all have their own purposes, but only some actually use the minis as a component of the game. Furthermore, there are many game players that can can't afford the minis, so they use synthetic stand-ins. The existence of unofficial minis may be looked down upon in some circles, but otherwise arguably don't affect the primary market for the originals. In the case of Warhammer or even D&D, &D, there was a game already created, but I don't see any reason why this process couldn't be reversed. And I wanted to point that out to the behavior that we're seeing is not new. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to consider this. Keep up the good work. Yeah, that's such a good uh, comparison. Uh, if you don't remember the loot bags, you know the idea was that you were getting play of a list of things that you could then break apart and potentially create a game around, but you wouldn't have to. They might have value on their own. And even though there's already a game for Warhammer, it's not like one needs to be created. A lot of parallels there. Uh, I, thought, I thought that was a really good comparison. And then Martin wrote in and said, in the past, I've done a manual version of Twitter's new unfollow option. I blocked the user, then unblocked them again. This did backfire on me once when it glitched. 
I'd clicked unblock, but the person was still blocked. On my account, it was showing the option to block them, but when they tried to follow me, it was showing that they were blocked. I resolved this by blocking and unblocking again. They turned it off and turned it on again, and then they were able to refollow me. So uh, at least now people won't have to go through the pain that Martin did uh, <laughs> in that particular case. There's definitely, remember a couple of years ago when, well, I don't know, this probably still happens today, but yeah, there would always be the, oh my gosh, how am I not following you? I was always following you. And it was like a very passive aggressive way for someone mm -hmm. to be like, I don't know what happened. Something happened mm -hmm. within Twitter, but nice to know uh, that there are glitches. So thank you for the, the anecdotes, Martin. And thank you to everybody who gives us feedback on stuff that we talk about on the show or stuff that you want us to talk about on a future show. Any questions, comments, send them our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to thank a few of our brand new bosses, Derek Wyman, Bjornar Sandvik, Nate Bob Benton, and Abdullah Amir, all who just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Derek. Thank you, Bjornar. Thank you, Nate Bob. And thanks, Abdullah. Good to have you back. So that was amazing because yesterday we said we were down one and and there are people who are, have financial difficulties. So we're always getting people like, ah, I wish I could, but I can't anymore. These four people picked up those people. Those people don't have to feel bad that they had to stop being patrons for, for reasons outside their own control because these four people came in and now we have the exact same amount of patrons we did at the start of the month, thanks to you four. So y'all are great. We really appreciate that. Now let's see what Len Peralta has been drawing during today's show. Uh, the robot unicorn, guys, is for children. It's for children. <laughs> But that's not going to stop people Is from it, getting Len? out of course. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I feel right. attacked. Exactly. Uh, no, it's it's totally fine. I can totally see uh, that this is going to become a thing. And uh, yeah, adults are going to want this. But, you know, take a look at this sad kid. He's saying he too big, <laughs> to be on it. <laughs> and that's probably, uh, you know, just think of the children before you get onto your robot unicorn and yeah, take it to advice. work. Yeah. yeah, this is very good work. Uh, this, uh, Children this image... is a state of mind. That's all I have <laughs> to say. No, hey, you're absolutely right. Nope. You're absolutely right. And to be honest with you, I'd probably want a robot unicorn too. So, uh, hey, work your magic there, Tom, and see if... Uh... <laughs> I have a lot of kids. Anyway, uh, this uh, image is available one. right now <laughs> at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store at lenperaldestore.com. Pick it up, put it on the wall. And uh, and let people know what you want for Christmas if it's even out by then. It's a, so. Use it as a, like a warning sign. Do not ride <laughs> unicorns. <laughs> Unless you I don't mean, break the children's this heart. It's not going to yeah. be out by Christmas, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah a girl can dream. <laughs> uh, speaking of unicorn lovers, Shannon Morris, good to have you on the show today. Uh, I know you're super busy, and let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Uh, thank you, fellow unicorn lover. YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse is the best place for that. I just uh, uploaded a tour of the USS North Carolina that I went to over in July. That was super fun. And I'm also going to be reviewing the new Galaxy Z Fold 3 upcoming probably nice. in the next couple of weeks. So definitely keep an eye out for that video. It's going to be really interesting. Definitely will. Uh, good stuff. We are live on this show. Hopefully you think this is good stuff. Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Join us live if you can. Always good to have you. Have a great weekend. We'll be back on Monday with Sherilyn Lowe. Talk to you soon. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Shannon Moore. 
course. Guests on this week's show included Nate Langson. Thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>